All right, hey, um, good morning, everyone. Um, so today we're going to move on into the cerebellum, but before we do that, we still have a little bit of unfinished stuff with the basal ganglia. Uh, as a sort of recap of where we are and where we're going, um, this is now our third to last class period. Um, today we're going to finish up the basal ganglia and discussion of Parkinson's disease, move on and discuss the cerebellum. Um, at the end of class today, we'll have about 20 or 25 minutes for you to get together with your blog groups and discuss the blog for assignment, recaps, uh, the short recap post is due tonight. Um, I know there's been, um, between Carnival and, and the end of the semester craziness, there are a lot of groups for which... Uh, you know, not everybody's finished, and if you're in a group uh, and you're sort of waiting on somebody else, then during that 20 minutes, um, uh, if you haven't already worked something out with Teresa um, uh, or me, then, then uh, let me know and we'll sort it all out. <coughs> um, Next week, we're going to talk about some things that relate to the cerebellum um, in terms of eye movements and uh, control of the vision. Of the, um, so um, uh, vestibular mediated, so, so as you move your head, there are reflexive eye movements, and also visual stimuli can cause eye movements. And so we'll talk about those two systems of eye movements. That sort of relates back to that first diagram we looked at the very first day of class with vestibular input and excitation and inhibition. And one of these uh, many examples now that we've seen, seen of circuits, kind of like this one that's diagrammed over there, where there's um, a bunch of connections, some of which are excitatory, some of which are inhibitory. And you kind of collectively work through and see how does activity at one point in the circuit influence the rest of this, uh, the, the uh, circuit and ultimately influence behavior, which is really, in a sense, like the main goal of this class is thinking about how connections between neurons ultimately and their ex ex excitation and inhibition and other aspects um, uh, ultimately give rise to some aspects of perception or behavior or whatever. Um, and then uh, on the last day of class, we're going to discuss the, um, uh, the papers that you're currently working through the last of the blog assignments for um, that involve um, reproductive behaviors and pair bonding um, in, uh, in uh, voles um, and some relationships between that and what we know about reproductive behaviors in humans. In addition to that, on the last day of class, we'll also be discussing um, some other things that are uh, that involve the basal ganglia. Here, this is sort of diagramming the basal ganglia and its connection specifically with motor cortex, which goes through the thalamic area of VLO. Um, there are multiple other thalamic areas that the basal ganglia connect to, as well as uh, thalamic areas that other parts um, that are sort of um, con uh, continuous with um, and, and sort of debatably whether it's an extension of the basal ganglia or a separate system, um, but, but other sets of neurons that have very similar circuitry um, that uh, connect up with frontal cortex um, and, uh, and uh, cingulate cortex and emotional areas and interact with the amygdala um, and give rise to um, uh, sort of emotion and, and motivation. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and it turns out that a lot of those circuits are also involved in this reproductive behavior stuff. Um, so that's the plan for the last day of class. Um, there's a review session uh, Sunday the 7th, and then the final exam is at 8.30. It's in Porter Hall, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, at the very end before we move on into the recap assignment. So for today... The main plan is these first two points, talking about uh, continuing our discussion of the basal ganglia, finishing uh, in Parkinson's disease and movement, and finishing that up and talking about that in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, dopamine receptors. Um, and then uh, second part of class today, um, talking about the circuitry within the cerebellum and its role in ongoing movement. So again, remember the basal ganglia, um, like we've talked about before, um, if you have some movement, actually, let me sort of extend this a little bit. So, um, so if we have some uh, some uh, uh, some sequence of movements that you're learning, and so in that sequence of movements, you do something, and then you stop, and then you do something else, and then you stop, and then you do something else, and then you stop, and you do something else, and then you stop. Then you stop. If you're if you're learning that then what you're going to see is that the basal ganglia activity um, will sort of come on at, at, and off and on and off 
every time you start and stop a new step. So these could be dance steps or, um, uh, thing or, or uh, um, fingers that you're moving to play the piano or whatever. Um, and actually the cerebellum is, is sort of also involved throughout this process, but not, um, but not as much for sort of, um, so this is uh, for, for some learning of a movement. Um, if you have some familiar sequence, um, another term that we sometimes call this is a habit, um, then Again, you're going to be doing the same sequence of movements, maybe even a little bit better because you're familiar with it. Um, but your brain has now strung this sequence of movements together into one continuous um, sort of habitual action. And so the basal ganglia um, gets involved early on and at the very end and not so much in the middle. Um, and then your cerebellum um, sort of gets involved throughout the whole process, making sure that you keep doing the right steps over and over and over again. So here, in the movement case, we're sort of plotting something about muscle activity and muscle activity here, and then something about neural activity going up or going down or whatever um, in the basal ganglia. Um, maybe the direct pathway becomes more active, um, uh, and the, uh, which, remember, the direct pathway was sort of our, our go pathway. Um, and the indirect pathway was sort of our stop pathway. Um, and so the, the direct pathway gets more active. Uh, uh, the indirect pathway might slow down. Um, but then um, for habitual movements, the cerebellum is sort of monitoring the ongoing thing. And its job is sort of twofold. Um, one aspect of the cerebellum's job is to um, prevent errors. Um, so as you're going through this complicated sequence, the cerebellum is kind of monitoring what you're doing to make sure you don't mess up and push the wrong, uh, 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 hit the wrong key on the piano, or um, uh, you know, hit go go to the wrong fret on the on the guitar, or uh, move the wrong foot in the dance steps, or whatever. Um, and then also, if in, if you start to make an error, ideally the cerebellum will get you to correct it quickly enough that you don't step on your partner's toes or whatever. Um, if the cerebellum fails at that, then you might find yourself sort of lost and don't know how to, how to continue. And then that's when you, it's like, okay, now we need to start over and get the basal ganglia back involved to reinitiate the movement, either from the beginning or from the middle. So that's sort of the, at high level kind of the relationship between these two structures. Um, what questions do people have about that before we move on to sort of finishing up the specifics of the basal ganglia? Um, okay, and so beyond that, um, this is probably continuing on into Tuesday, um, but the slides are already up for this, which is, um, as we talk about the cerebellum, it gets involved as well in eye movements, um, and, um, and, uh, and there are different sort of aspects of uh, visually guided eye movements and, um, and balanced circuitry and reflexive eye movements, and so we may get into a little bit of that t uh, toward the end of class today or, or maybe uh, on Monday. So um, this is uh, a slide that we saw a couple of times last class period, and I've redrawn it over here. Um, I've added in these fast spiking inhibitory local interneurons in the striatum, which are not present in this slide. Um, but otherwise, it sort of uh, recapitulates um, uh, everything that we've talked about last class period. Um, we'll return to those fast spiking interneurons after we have a little bit of a discussion of the D1 and D2 receptors. Um, <clears throat> but uh, just so you, uh, to, to sort of remind you um, and, and sort, of, uh, sort of continue where we were last time, um, one area that I was just starting to talk about is the substantia nigra pars compacta or SNC. Um, and the SNC is located right next to the SNR, which is, has a completely different function, um, but they're both located sort of at the very front top of the brainstem. 
right over here. So this bulge on the brain stem is called the pons. This giant bulge on the back of the brain stem that's all wrinkly is the cerebellum. And in fact, the pons and the cerebellum work together a lot. And we'll talk about that in the second half of class today. But above the pons, at the front of the brain stem, is, the, is an area called the substantia nigra. Um, it literally just means black stuff. Um, and those cells appear dark and, and black um, without any stain. And one of the reasons for that is they have a high density of an enzyme called tyrosine hydroxylase that makes dopamine. Um, and so the substantia nigra pars compacta is one of two brain areas, the other being the ventral tegmental area, which is also right next to it at the top front of the brain stem, that produces dopamine. Um, and the ventral tegmental area, as we'll talk about, projects to a variety of different places in the brain, including this sort of extension of the basal ganglia that I alluded to a couple minutes ago that's kind of a motivational center in the brain. But for today, we're going to focus in on the substantia nigra pars compacta and its role in, in sort of coordinating motor movement in the basal ganglia. Um, and so what we worked out last time and what we also saw demonstrated with those videos that I showed you is that if you express channel rhodopsin, so we can take advantage, any, any time we have a, some neurons sort of interspersed together in a brain area and we're interested in how, how some fraction of them behave differently from a different fraction of them, um, one of the, the, the great tools that, that um, is, is uh, extremely popular in systems neuroscience right now is channel rhodopsin, which we've talked about a lot already in the class. And so um, it happens that some of these um, um, MSNs or um, so um, which stands for medium spiny neurons and these are the projection neurons from the striatum um, and actually as a sort of brief aside the name medium spiny neuron uh, as with many things, is sort of an old anatomical turn, term. Um, their dendrites have little protrusions on them called spines. We talked a little bit about spines um, as, as places of synaptic connection um, earlier on in the semester. Um, not in a lot of great detail. Um, but in, in the striatum, you actually find basically three types of neurons. There are really big neurons that I haven't drawn here that release acetylcholine. Um, and the role of acetylcholine in Parkinson's disease is its own sort of topic. Um, it turns out acetylcholine has sort of opposing effects from dopamine. Um, but we're not going to get into that uh, uh, this semester. Um, then there are the small neurons, which are these fast spiking local inhibitory interneurons that release GABA locally. And then there are the medium-sized neurons, which happen to have spines all over their dendrites, and those are the ones that project axons out of the basal ganglia. Um, and so last time, what we talked about is that if you take advantage of this genetic difference, which is that some medium spiny neurons happen to express the D1 type dopamine receptor. And so you can use that fact to drive channel rhodopsin expression just in these D1 expressing medium spiny neurons. And also it happens that the ones that express the D1 dopamine receptor make a direct projection out to the output structures of the basal ganglia. which are the globus pallidus internal segment and the substantia nigra pars reticulata. Um, so, so they make a direct projection. And what we worked out last time, sort of logically with the circuit, as well as demonstrated by these channel rhodopsin experiments in the videos that I showed, is that if you activate the D1 expressing neurons. That means these cells are more active. That means there's more inhibition here, which means less inhibition of the thalamus, which means 
more excitation onto the motor cortex and ultimately more movement. Um, questions about that before we move on? Because these circuits are like, this is, this is the most complicated, so the eye movement ones are pretty close too, but this is among the most complicated and confusing circuits that, that we see in this class. So questions about that. Um, notice also that the, that the cortex is providing some of the excitatory drive into this. And so the cortex is, one way I like to think about it is that the cortex is telling the basal ganglia through this excitatory input sort of what it thinks we ought to do. And then the basal ganglia is figuring out which subsets of neurons need to become active to make those movements happen. But um, when, we, when these cells start firing, we have inhibition of inhibition, which, can, which sort of works out to be a positive signal. And so we move more. And we can see that in, in normal mice. We can also see that if we have a mouse that we've destroyed the um, dopamine producing cells in the substantia nigra pars compacta, which is what happens in Parkinson's disease, <clears throat> those mice move less until we start activating these same D1 expressing medium spiny neurons, and then they start being able to move again. Okay, Just some questions, gotta be some questions at this point about some of that. Nope, okay. Everyone's, I guess, maybe tired this morning or uh, got it all figured out. Okay, so um, the other pathway out is these, so again, genetically distinct neurons that express a different gene, in this case the D2 type dopamine receptor. And I've sort of drawn them again over here. The substantia nigra makes the dopamine releasing synapse. Um, onto, makes dopamine releasing synapses onto these, and so the D1 receptor expressing ones versus the D2 receptor, just, uh, receptor expressing ones are going to make different projections, either directly to the output uh, structures, the GP and the SNR, or indirectly to the output structures. And so what happens with the, when you activate the D2 expressing MS medium spiny neurons, then they inhibit the GPE, so now that is going down in its firing, which its job is to inhibit the subthalamic nucleus, and so these are slower, so there's less inhibition, so this goes up. And then this excites the output structure, so the output structure is going up in its activity. And then that means you're getting more inhibition of the thalamus, which is going to slow down your movement, or stop your movement. And so when we activate those cells, we get the animals to freeze a lot more and walk a lot less. Okay, yeah. What questions do people have about anything? Yeah? Which one wins um, since the indirect and the direct pathways will be simultaneous? Um, um, yeah. <coughs> so what happens is um, the striatum is a pretty large structure with, um, in a mouse, hundreds of thousands of neurons, in a human, um, uh, maybe tens of millions of neurons in it. Um, and in fact, um, we don't, there's not, there doesn't seem to be, or at least if there is, we haven't worked out a whole lot of organization. There's some sort of sub-organizations that people have worked out. Um, but when I'm choosing to move, if I activated all of the D1MSNs everywhere in the striatum, I would probably just start making crazy movements. And, um, and so, in fact, um, uh, your cortex is sort of helping figure out which subset, this inputs from the cortex, figuring out, okay, so some D1s get active to activate a specific motor plan, and a, and a bunch of D2s get active to shut off a bunch of other things you could do. So, you know, in any moment in time, you could start doing jumping jacks, you could turn and punch the person next to you in the face, you could, there's, a, there's, there's, there's nearly infinite numbers of things that you could do, uh, most of which you're not going to do, and only some of which you are. And so which ones you are um, depends somehow um, in ways that are not fully understood on which D1 cells get active and which D2 cells are active. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions about? Did that help? Did I answer? Yeah. yeah. Other questions about that? 
Um, yeah, sure. So any sort of activation on D1 in the sense promotes movement? Yes. Yes, that's right. Yeah. So when the D ones start, so so action potentials, um, yeah. So so um, direct go. So so um, so uh, action potentials. When when these cells are firing action potentials, that promotes movement. When these cells are firing action potentials, that inhibits movement. Okay. Any any levels of like activation, like result in like slow movement or fast movement? Yeah. Um, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I suspect. That um, slow movement might actually be not about levels of activation, but there might actually be a different po different populations of D1 cells for um, running versus jogging, for example. Even though the sequence of movements is this is very similar, um, you might have a different sort of mental motor plan for two for those two activities. Yeah. Um, oh yeah, yeah. Are they fire the laser? Are they activating the strida directly? Or are they activating? The the, these are in, in, into the striatum, um, and and it's a pretty blunt instrument um, uh, in the sense that um, there are these sort of uh, organized uh, pools of neurons that I was talking about. Um, they're um, they sort of have um, so the the virus that expresses chanarodopsin um, only hits about ten percent of the cells, but it's probably roughly a random ten percent of the cells, and so it's a little bit surprising that the animal is even able to move at all. Um, and that also speaks to the fact that the striatum is not the only thing controlling which movements, but the cortex does have some some role as well in figuring in, in figuring out like what movement to make. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, so we'll take let's take about. Uh, Eight minutes ish. Um, there's a semi, uh, sort of long assignment um, uh, with uh, two two questions, um, each of which has three parts. Um, so get together in a group and figure it out. And so your assignment is to figure out um, uh, make a hypo. So I haven't told you anything about when dopamine gets released here versus here. What happens inside the cell? Um, although some of you may already know from other classes that you've taken. Um, but um, but what, what happens um, inside the cell in terms of excitation, inhibition, um, whether dopamine is excitatory or inhibitory in this, um, then come up with an experiment that you could do where you're going to, um, you figure out what the manipulation is, but what you're going to do is electrically record neurons in, in um, isolated slices from brains to test your hypothesis. Then a second experiment that you're going to, a second manipulation that you're going to do where you're going to have some behavioral testing um, that tests the same hypothesis about what the D1 receptors are doing, whether they're excitatory or inhibitory. And then do everything again, but for the D2 receptors in the D2 expressing MSNs that are part of the indirect pathway. And so we'll take about eight minutes to work through that, um, try and answer those as a group, write your names on the papers and everything like that, um, and then we'll come back and discuss it together as a class after that. One thing that might help with the Part C on both is there are drugs that specifically activate D1 or specifically inhibit D1 and drugs that specifically activate or specifically inhibit D2. Actually, that might help for both. Okay, so um, it seems like almost all the groups are done. Um, well, you can, if you're still working on it, you can kind of keep writing quietly as we go through and discuss as a group. So first of all, for, um, for question 1A, um, does, who wants to sort of volunteer a little bit about what their group decided in terms of whether they have hypothesis about whether activating those D1 receptors, releasing dopamine onto those direct pathway medium spiny neurons is going to cause those, those medium spiny neurons to fire more or fire less? Yeah. Uh, sure, yeah. They would be excitatory because okay. it's part of the GO. Okay, so you said they're excitatory because it's part of the GO pathway. Um, uh, so, um, uh, in any, um, well, I guess yeah, we'll maybe come back to that in a second, but um, uh, keep picking on your group, which now your group's going to hate, hate, hate you for raising your hand. Um, but let's, uh, so, um, uh, let's see, so uh, maybe somebody else, so, so um, for part B, do, did anyone from, from your group want to say, what was the experiment that you suggested in terms of how you would test that 
um, in, uh, in, with isolated brain slices. What are you going to record from? What are you going to stimulate? How are you going to test that idea? Yeah, great. Yeah, so we could wash with dopamine. Um, you could also, if you wash with a D1 specific inhibitor, you might expect them to slow down. If you wash with a D1 specific agonist or activator, which is the same, same uh, synonymous term, then you would ex also expect them to depolarize. Um, so sticking with this, the D1 is excitatory um, uh, idea for a second. Um, any other groups have that same hypothesis for number 1A that want to share something about part C? All right, uh, Jake? Um, what did you get? For our behavioral testing, we were just going to treat with a D1 type dopamine receptor uh, agonist. Yeah, a D1 agonist. If you, I, I don't remember if I've introduced this term. Uh, that just, that's just a drug that activates specifically. So D1 agonist, yeah. And then, um, if we're correct in our hypothesis that the D1 expressive, or the D1 expressive, or the D1 type dopamine receptor is uh, like, uh, excitatory, then we would expect to see, like in a behavioral output, we would expect to see an increase in motor activity in individuals treated with the diagnosis. Yeah, so we expect increase in movement. Um, so, one other thing that you might consider um, and that comes up on your reports, I think has come up a little bit already on the blog assignments, and also um, uh, might come up on questions on the final, is to think about alternate possible results and how you might interpret those. So if we had, for example, if we go with this, this, this number C, we, this is our expectation. If we really did this and we saw a decrease in movement, and maybe we really did this and we saw a decrease in activity, how would that affect our original hypothesis? Yeah, then you start to think it's inhibition. Um, in fact, let me erase that before people start writing it down. Um, in fact, when you do this experiment, you see exactly what, what these groups predicted. That, um, act, that, that um, uh, so we actually do get this, we actually do get this. And so, in fact, the D1 neuro, the D1 receptor is an excitatory receptor. <coughs> so leads to more action potentials over here in our D1 expressing MSN. Um, okay, yeah, questions about that? Um, as yeah. A, as an alternative, like, um, I guess, like, that, like, if we just did part C and that was our results, I mean, is not another interpretation of that, like, how specific are D1 agonists, like, is there any, like, Affinity for the D2 type receptor that's going to We're, yeah, they're, they're, yeah in, in, in the real world, drugs are often messy. Sometimes it might even activate, it's actually more likely to activate like a beta adrenergic receptor than it would be to activate a D2 because there's actually more similarities than, well, I guess it depend, depends. Um, in reality, drugs are messy. In the purpose of this class, we're going to assume drugs are sort of specific enough that we can do these experiments and interpret them cleanly. Would it have been better, like more specific, if we had done the channel reduction route and then just? Yeah, the I mean that's another way to do it. Um, yeah, so 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 yeah, you could do instead of a D1 agonist, you could do channel rhodopsin. Yeah, you could wash on dopamine plus a D D1 antagonist. There are a lot of different combinations. Um, and actually, for the final exam, I should remind everybody. I mentioned this last time. Um, you're going to get between four to six prompts. There are five prompts as samples um, up on Blackboard as a practice, um, and it's just going to be on one sheet of paper with no space to write. Um, and then you're going to get a blue book that has 16 pages in it, um, and you're going to answer in that blue book um, the, the, um, their longer essay prompts. Um, I've, uh, I've got some, some ideas 
for how you might uh, think about approaching it, but for a lot of these, um, one of the things that you're going to need to do is refer back to some of the research articles that we've talked about in class, um, and also be thinking about designing experiments like this. I might ask you to think about alternative hypotheses, and so this activity specifically is like really designed to sort of help you get ready for a lot of the kinds of questions that you're going to be seeing on the final exam. Um, Okay, yeah, other questions about the D1 stuff before we move on to D2. Okay, so, um, so number two, our D2. Um, anyone want to share um, uh, their hypothesis about what the D2 receptors do? How, how they affect those medium spiny neurons that express them when dopamine is released onto those cells? Did he, let's, let's do this. I won't call on people who raise their hand, but who, came, who thought the D2 are probably exciting this, the, the neurons? Who thought they're probably inhibiting the neurons? Okay, a lot of people thought they're probably inhibiting the neurons. Um, uh, so um, let's, let's, play, let's play a slightly different game. Um, this may get us a little bit behind, but I can, we, can, we can do the cerebellum and eye movement stuff together. Let's imagine a universe, so I'll do purple again, where... In fact, D2 excites. Sort of purple for hypothetical here. If D2 excites, our part B is going to be pretty similar to what we saw for part A, right? Which is going to be we, we wash on dopamine or wash on a D2-specific agonist um, and expect to see depolarization of these D2-expressing medium spiny neurons, right? Um, in our alternate universe, or our sort of hypothetical universe, of D2 being excitatory, when we put on, let's sort of continue with this here, if we put on a D2 agonist into the striatum of a, of a living animal, what are we going to expect to see behaviorally out of that animal? So D2 excites the, so the, D, the D2 receptor excites those indirect projecting medium spiny neurons. And so those cells are firing action potentials. What does that do to our animal's behavior? Yeah. Less. Yeah, so we would get less movement. Okay, so this is sort of, this is sort of our imaginary universe. Um, so a lot of so basically everybody raised their hand saying that they, they thought that the reality was that D two as a receptor is inhibitory, and so um, so for part B we might say that if we wash on dopamine or a D two agonist. We would expect these um, uh, these indirect medium spiny neurons to slow down, right? Does that make sense? Do, do, if D two receptors are inhibitory, when we activate them, they should slow down the cells. Um, then, what should we see? What, what, so, who wants to share an experiment that they came up with for behavioral stuff? with D2, now under the sort of idea of D2 being inhibitory as a receptor. All right, let's see. I get to pick on people then. Gowry, what did you come up with? So, for the behavioral? Yeah, for part 2C. Yeah, um, we should see. So, um, uh, one one comment about that uh, idea is that um, if you're doing both a D two agonist and a D one antagonist, it can be hard to know which of them is really having the effect. We would predict, just based on the stuff over here on number one, that a D1 antagonist, a blocker, by itself should slow down movement. 
So um, I would say that actually um, that, that, that that's a, a, a great approach, but that a cleaner experiment, if you really want to just understand the D2, is just this, just the D2 agonists. And then again, expecting less movement. Um, and so, you know, in fact, that is, if you do the experiments, those are exactly what you get. Um, and so, <coughs> um, the D2 receptor is inhibitory. <coughs> um, and so thinking about these experiments, thinking about alternative results, alternative possibilities, um, uh, and, and how you might test a particular hypothesis um, is something that you, that you should be expecting to see on the final exam. Bu building off of these circuits that we've already got, and again, since the final is open notes and everything, um, I'm just going to assume that you're going to have all of these drawings and all of these slides available to you on the final. Um, any questions about that? Okay, so this is the books diagram of this, which I don't like. I, don't, I, I actually kind of like the diagram that, that I stole from Dr. Geddes, which is the one over there. Um, the book diagrams, um, it, the, the connections are all sort of the same, um, but, uh, but um, and in fact, uh, here, blue is excitatory um, and red is inhibitory. Um, the SNCVTA releases dopamine and it excites the D1 cells, it inhibits the D2 cells, um, and then all of these inhibitory connections. Um, they contrast. So, so one of the sort of um, take-home messages of this is that D dopamine on the D1 neurons ultimately enhances movement. Um, oops, I got that backwards. Let's back up. D2 agonists over here. Backwards. D2 agonists lead to less activity on the indirect pathway. If we slow down the indirect pathway, well, we, so when we speed up the indirect pathway, what happens to movement? More or less movement? Less. So if we slow down the indirect activity, what happens to movement? More movement. So in fact, a D2 agonist should actually give us more movement because it's slowing down the stop pathway. This is where this is where people kind of lose lose track of everything and are like, oh my god, this is too freaking overwhelming. Um, but because um, the indirect pathway, there's like three inhibitory connections, and then all of a sudden there's a fourth inhibitory connection, right? So um, our our SNC excites this but inhibits this. One, so if there's an odd number of inhibitions, so, right, so if we have one inhibitory connection, then we're going to slow things down. If we have two inhibitory connections in a row, then we slow down and then therefore we have less inhibition, so we speed something up. And that's what happens in the direct pathway. In the indirect pathway, going from here, this goes up, this goes down, therefore, so this, this goes up, causes this to go down, causes this to go up, causes this to go down. Now this is excitatory, so we don't switch. This goes down, and therefore this goes up, and therefore we move. So, um, so this is where people get like, oh my god, this, the basal ganglia is ridiculous. And, it, and, and, um, and again, thank goodness the, the final is open notes um, and everything. Um, but uh, so, in fact, with um, normal, uh, normal or high levels of dopamine, we are turning up the go cells, so we move. We are turning down the stop cells so we don't stop. Conversely, with low levels of dopamine, we are not activating the GO cells and we are not inhibiting the stop cells. 
Okay, so who's completely lost about that at this point? Yeah, would you have, would you have a specific I question? Have a question. Like, does an agonist activate the neuron or does it just bind It the activates the receptor. Yeah, so, so if the receptor inhibits the neuron, then, it, then the agonist for the receptor will slow the neuron down. Yeah, it's, it's a sort of receptor-specific terminology, not a neuron-specific terminology. Channel rhodopsin would activate or, or, or would, would, would turn on the neuron and make it fire. But, um, but drug agonists turn on receptors, and then whether that receptor is excitatory or inhibitory determines what the neuron does as a consequence. Yeah, great point. Yeah, sure. Exactly, yes. Because when we, so back here, when we use channel rhodopsin to make those cells fire, that stopped the animal. So if we use dopamine to make those cells stop, then that's going to get the animal going. Yeah, there's like, it's, it, it's like, a, it's like, a, it's like, it's, it's literally a quadruple negative um, that you're dealing with here. Um, and so um, it's an incredibly easy to get lost. The bottom line is that dopamine promotes movement, and it does it in two parallel ways. The first is by turning on the go pathway, the second is by turning down the stop pathway. And that's and, and, and one reason one way I remember that is that like methamphetamine and cocaine increase dopamine levels. They give you a high, which we'll talk about on the last day of class when we talk about reward systems. Um, but they also make people hyperactive. And the reason that methamphetamine and cocaine make people hyperactive is because they're increasing dopamine here, which is turning on the go system. They're increasing dopamine here, which is turning off the stop system. And because the dopamine receptors are intrinsically either excitatory or inhibitory depending on the neurons, you get opposite effects locally at the neuron, but then because of the different numbers of inhibitory connections coming out, you get the same ultimate behavioral consequence. That's, I know, super confusing. Um, what other questions do people have about that? Yeah? Can we kind of follow the um, indirect pathway, like starting with if the substantia nigra actually produces, like, releases dopamine? Yeah, yeah, sure. So, so, so three steps and it's a little Yeah, so, um, okay, so, so the substantia nigra releases dopamine. So now it, that, it, that dopamine inhibits these cells. So what happens to their firing? Decrease. Decrease, right. That decrease in firing, those cells are normally releasing GABA over here. And so they are normally inhibiting here, but they've slowed down. So what happens to these cells? So they increase their firing. They increase their firing, right. So now these cells are going more. Their job is also to release GABA. And so now they're firing a lot, releasing GABA. What happens on their targets? So that, but if the GPD is increased, the SPN is decreased. Yeah, decreased on the STN. Now this is the excitatory connection that releases glutamate with AMPA receptors. So the, now we have less activity coming out here. So what happens to the firing rate here? Less. Less, less right? Less inhibition of the thalamus. And then, yeah, and so now these have slowed down. So now there's less GABA coming out onto the thalamus. So what happens to the thalamus? Uh, it increases. It increases. And then from here, everything else is excitatory. The thalamus excites motor cortex, which excites these, and so that's why you move. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. L literally a quadruple negative that we're dealing with on that pathway. Other questions about that? Okay, here's the, here's the book's characterization of... Um, of dopamine release in, in, in the, the um, situation with low dopamine, with normal dopamine levels, where your D1s are gonna be pretty excited, your D2s are gonna be pretty inhibited, and therefore the, 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 uh, the sort of yeah, um, pallidum refers to GPE, uh, GPI, sorry. The book, anyway, too many terms. Um, on this topics guide, I made, um, uh, at the very end, near the very end of the topic guide, I have a list of like annoying, literally called like annoying terms and synonyms um, at the very end of the topic guide. Um, so you have handy because the book 
uses different terms, different sources use different terms. Um, there, it's just really in this system that I have those annoying terms and synonyms, but, it, but throughout the class there have been a number of those, and if people want to review those during the question and answer session on Sunday night or something, happy to do that. Not this Sunday, a week from Sunday. In low dopamine levels, now the D1s are less excited, the D2s are more inhibited, and ultimately the pallidum, the, which is the, G, uh, um, which is, um, the GPI um, sl uh, slash SNR, um, becomes uh, more active, thus inhibiting the thalamus. <laughs> you doing all right there? <laughs> okay. Other questions about this? Okay, so we're, we're probably not going to end up getting to the cerebellum today, but I do want to um, <clears throat> quickly talk about two research articles that relate to these, um, these fast spiking interneurons here. Um, we'll just end up talking about the cerebellum together with eye movements uh, on Tuesday. Um, okay, so um, the first, um, uh, these are both work done by Aaron Giddes, who's a faculty member here, teaches cellular neuroscience, um, and um, the first of those is um, looking at these fast spiking interneurons and just so recording from a fast spiking interneuron with an electrode, randomly picking a, a D1 or D2 expressing medium spiny neurons. The way she figured out whether a cell is D1 or D2 ex expressing is by having different colors of fluorescent proteins. So um, the, the, um, the D1 expressing cells have uh, red fluorescent protein in them, and the D2 expressing cells have, uh, have a, a bluish fluorescent protein, and then the fast spiking cells have a green fluorescent protein in them. So you've got three different colors of essentially green fluorescent protein, but there's green, blue, and red, um, and so that lets her see, you know, know which cell type she's recording from. And so if she um, puts one electrode in a fast spiking interneuron, another in a D1 MSN that's close by, and then just says, if I make this fast spiking cell fire, do I see a response in the, in the, um, uh, in the um, medium spiny neuron? These fast spiking interneurons, by the way, they release GABA. So they're inhibitory. And so all she's looking at here, all they're looking at is the, the rate, the, 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 the probability that um, a particular um, uh, um, uh, fast spiking cell, that a randomly chosen fast spiking cell is going to have a connection to a randomly chosen D1 medium spiny neuron or a randomly chosen D2 expressing medium spiny neuron. And so what they find is that about half of the D1 expressing cells have um, input from, uh, from, from a fat, for a given fast spiking cell there's about a 50% chance that a nearby D1 neuron will, be connect, will get an input from it. Um, for a randomly chosen D2 cell, there's about a, a third, of, a, a 30 percent chance, 35 percent chance that, that um, it'll be getting input from a neighboring fast spiking cell. So really all this is showing us is that these fast spiking cells, these are in normal animals that we haven't done anything special to, get, um, are more uh, 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 get, get denser connections, the fast spiking cells make denser connections onto the D1 cells than they do onto the D2 cells. Questions about that? Okay, the second study, which is the, the second one here, is to say, okay, well, what happens after we, um, you can use a toxin to destroy these dopamine producing cells and these mice develop Parkinson's. This is exactly the same thing that um, way back in uh, uh, this article was done here. 6-OHDA, the lesion, the destruction of the dopamine producing cells, we give these mice Parkinson's disease. And so then you give them a couple weeks after they've developed Parkinson's disease and then you look at the brain connectivity. And what they observed is that is really sort of captured best over here. Well, I guess actually, yeah, so, so it's it sort of summarized, similar data summarized in A, but we'll kind of look at B and C in particular. So um, once again, 
approximately half, three days after we destroy the, 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 um, the, the dopamine producing cells, about half of the, the D1 cell, if we're given fast spiking to D1 combination, there's about a 50% chance you're going to find a connection. Um, either in control, which is the open, where they just injected a salt, salt into the substantia nigra, or when they injected this toxin that destroys the cells in the substantia nigra. So comparing these two, there's about the same. Um, looking across um, a week later, again, there's about the same. There hasn't seemed to be any change. So these fast spiking cells don't change the way they connect up with these D1 expressing medium spiny neurons. However, um, if you look at the connections from fast spiking cells onto the D2 expressing medium spiny neurons, um, what you find is that um, in saline animals, very much the same as before, as in naive controls, only about a third of the D2 cells are getting input from a randomly chosen nearby fast spiking cell. Um, but three days or a week, they sort of uh, get the same result. After you destroy these dopamine producing neurons, you're now getting more inhibitory projections onto these D2 medium spiny neurons. Um, and so um, another great question for the final exam would be to show you this data or give you this paper and ask you to think about what might be going on and what might be happening. Actually, they discuss it in the paper, so I might have to be, I might only give you the results and not the discussion, who knows. But, um, but, um, but one of the ways they interpret this is if you remember, the D2 cells are the stop pathway. And so by inhibiting, what happens is essentially what's going on is the brain is compensating for this par partially compensating or trying to compensate. Um, and so we're slowing down the stop cells. We're giving more inhibition onto the D2 stop neurons. And by giving more inhibition onto these D2 stop cells, that is going to make them slow down and thus lead to, just like we diagrammed before, when these cells slow down, ultimately that's going to improve our ability to move. Um, it doesn't fully solve the problem because these mice, as we saw last time in the videos, still have um, um, Parkinson's-like symptoms. Um, but the idea is this is at least a partial compensation, and if it weren't for that, the mice would either develop Parkinson's faster or their Parkinson's would be even worse. Um, and in fact, the D2, uh, and so, and so the, and then the D2 expressing, um, uh, so, so here we're slow, again slowing down more inhibition onto the stop pathway, which therefore means that it's going to relieve some of the Parkinson's like symptoms. Okay, so what questions do people have about that? Yeah, sure. Um, so because there's still no release to D1, it yeah. doesn't actually reduce the symptoms, right? Um, well, so what's happened is, yes, I mean, it's sort of only a partial compensation, right? So we, by killing these cells, we've lost some of the inhibition onto this. And so we're compensating by increasing a different source of inhibition onto this. It's not a perfect compensation for a variety of reasons, one of which being that we haven't turned up, at least by this, the D1. Now maybe you could, you know, could ask you for follow-up experiments or ask you to think, but one thing that you might imagine is maybe the cortex also starts sending more strong excitation here <coughs> to compensate for that. I don't know if anyone's ever looked at that. I'll ask Aaron next time if anyone's ever looked at that. Um, but that would be another compensatory response. Um, that, that would, um, uh, or we could, we didn't see it, but it would have been possible to see less inhibition onto these D1 stops, um, which would have also been a sort of comp compensatory response. Yeah. Other questions about that? Okay, so for the last 20 minutes or so, um, we'll get together in your blog groups, discuss, and get ready for the blog recap post that you need to post tonight. Um, we'll just do again like ABC, DEF. Uh, uh, GHI and so on. Um, if you if you haven't if somebody hasn't posted everything in your group and you haven't worked things out with me and Teresa already, just raise your hand and let me know, and, and I'll help you sort of figure out what to do to get everything done.